Okay. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our International Women's Day author chat here at Pamunkey Regional Library. My name is Kate, and I am the librarian and branch manager at the Mechanicsville branch. And today we are celebrating International Women's Day. And what is that and why is it a thing? Well, because women are awesome. Let's just stop. I mean, women are awesome, right? So the first Women's Day was actually observed March 9th, 1911 in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland. Um, so there were campaigns across Europe against World War I, and that inspired women in other countries to adopt International Women's Day. And then that date was then moved to March 8th in 1913. So that's why we actually celebrate it on March 8th. So joining us today, we have three extraordinary female authors who in their own right just deserve to just have a whole program just based on them and not who they actually write about. But so we're gonna go ahead and for those of you who don't know who's joining us today, we're gonna do a little bit of an introduction. So first off, all of our authors are New York Times and USA Today best-selling authors. So first off, hooray, kudos for that. Um, amazing, just amazing. You know, when you start out as an author, did any of you guys think you'd get to this point in your career? <laughs> I think that's always the dream, right? But then yeah. does, is that actually like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do that. And we never imagined we'd be Brady Bunch heads. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty cool, uh, right? It's all <laughs> different, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, so let's go ahead and Melanie Benjamin is the author of seven historical novels, including Mistress of the Ritz, The Girls in the Picture, The Swans of Fifth Avenue, and The Aviator's Wife. Her novels have been translated into over 15 languages, featured in national magazines, such as Good Housekeeping, People, Entertainment Weekly, and also Option for Film. Her latest novel, The Children's Blizzard, there you go, uh, was inspired by the devastating storm that struck the Great Plains in 1888 and threatened the lives of hundreds of immigrant homesteaders, especially children. So Melanie wanted to say hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks uh, for having me. So next up, Stephanie Dre is the author of historical fiction and fantasy. She has co-written five historical novels, including Ribbons of Scarlet, My Dear Hamilton, America's First Daughter, and individually released a three book series on Cleopatra's Daughter. Her novels have been translated into eight languages, nominated for a Rita Award, and won the Golden Leaf Award. Her latest novel, The Women of Chateau Lafayette, right there, beautiful, um, is an epic saga based on the true story of the castle in the heart of France, and the three women bound by its legacy in humanity's darkest hours. So Steph, how about you give a little wave? <laughs> and last but not least, Lauren Willig. She is the author of more than 20 works of historical fiction, including The Summer Country, The English Wife, the Rita award-winning Pink Carnation series, and three novels that she co-wrote, the most recent being All the Ways We Said Goodbye. Her books have been translated into over a dozen languages, awarded the Rita Booksellers Best and Golden Leaf Awards, and been chosen for the American Library Association's annual list of the best genre fiction. Her latest novel, The Band of Sisters, is based on the true story of a group of young women from Smith College who risked their lives in France during World War I. Big, fat, juicy books, ladies. First mm -hmm. up, they're huge, they're wonderful, they're amazing. Um, let's get right to it though. Um, we're kind of gonna go round robin and then we've got, you know, hopefully we'll have some chats available to where we can go ahead and, and get some author interaction. But, so each of these stories is so different, so different. Um, Melanie, I'd like to start with you. First off, this is a very different book from your previous titles. Why did you decide to make the change in your yeah, writing? I, I don't. It's. I don't know that I made a change consciously. I. I. I think all my books are different, right? They're. They're. 
most of them have been this what we call biographical historical fiction where they're about real people but other than that they're all over the place <laughs> as far as time period and uh, physical geographical setting mm -hmm. and issues so i've never thought that i was the kind of writer who all my books kind of lined up and, and you could see a sameness to them i never thought that i was like that so it surprised me when people did say that this one seemed like such a departure and I really couldn't understand why. Um, I will, you know, it is the first historical novel that I've written that is not about a real person who's lived. Um, it is about a real event that happened. And I think I did want that that change to stretch myself as an author. Um, I, I just, at the time, I just didn't think I was going to be uh, challenged enough to keep writing the bio biographical historical fiction that I had read, written, although never say never, because I think my next book's going back to that. But, <laughs> uh, but I also, there were a lot of things about this story that attracted me that made me want to write this story. One, it was a huge story, like you said, and the elements are very big. It, it's, it is based on an actual blizzard that happened in 1888. They hit the Great Plains right when school was letting out, and it was a day that had dawned warm, so that uh, it's called the school. It is known to history as the children's blizzard because so many of its victims were children. Um, so many people had come out unprepared that day for the elements for the tragedy that was going to strike. And it's I was very fascinated about this because it's an immigrant story because so many of those settling the Great Plains in that time period, um, 1880s, were immigrants to this country. There was a great disinformation campaign to bring them here, which I thought had a lot of parallels, you know, kind of masquerading as news um, to things going on today. But at its heart, it's, it's a survival against the element story with women at its heart. And the school teachers who had to make these these life and death decisions in an instant, you know, they were just young women, 16 years old, 17 years old, most of them who'd gotten up that day, like we all get up during the day, not expecting that they were going to have to literally, you know, to be responsible for the lives of the children in their charge. And that they had to make these decisions, should they stay? In these really poorly insulated school, one room schoolhouses, the prairie schoolhouse that we kind of know from Little House on the Prairie, or should they try to get the children to safety? Because those the schoolhouses were not built to survive against the elements, and there was not enough fuel, and there weren't, you know, certainly not enough food. And so these these school teachers had to make these decisions. And so the book focuses on two sisters each school teachers who make the exact opposite decisions in that heartbreaking moment and how the impact of those decisions change their lives and the lives of the students in their care forever. And um, so I just was really attracted to a big story set against the elements, which has never been a part of any of my other books. So that really attracted to me. You know, how many ways can I describe snow? How many ways can I describe ice and wind and cold? And that was a challenge. It's a writing exercise that I really enjoyed. Um, but also it is a, a more diverse cast because there are, um, there are there's a black um, homesteader in here and we do the Native Americans tragedy certainly hovers over the book. Um, there's a, a, a male protagonist who is one of those who wrote these kind of fake news stories that lured settlers here who finds his redemption in the aftermath of the storm. So it was a very big cast. So it's kind of like my Poseidon adventure set <laughs> against the the snow of 1888. And um, I just yeah, that's why I wanted to write it, because I was ready for that challenge as a writer. I was really eager to stretch those muscles. Well, I think it's an amazing book, and I, I've read several of your other ones, and, and you're right. I mean, this one definitely um, is is a stretch from, from your previous writings, because it is such a hardcore, heavy book topic. Now, certainly Mistress of the Ritz was, you know, right. World War II, so granted, yeah. you, you can't take that away, but it's a very different book than what you've, what you've written before. Yeah, no, this um, I like that, like you said, I mean, you're not just talking about one woman, but right. you're talking about just women overall, you know, and, and the struggles that the immigrant families and the women of those families that they had and the decisions that they had to make with no with no knowledge really whatsoever it was like all right let's do this and see what happens and i know. love the challenge of writing it i mean i wanted to make i wanted to find the beauty in the tragedy because certainly there's a 
there is a tragic element to this story. You know, not everyone's going to make it. Um, but certainly I want to, there are stories of hope, though, in the way that some of these young women's lives change for the better in the aftermath of the storm due to the reporting of the storm was really fascinating to me. They came, they kind of became media darlings <laughs> in a way, the ones who were deemed yep. to have made the right decision. Um, I do look at it as Little House on the Prairie for grown-ups. Um, I loved those books growing mm -hmm. up, but certainly I, I recognize the problems in them as an adult in this time period and I wanted to you know Caroline Ingalls and Paul Ingalls um, if you read between the lines of those books are Paul is a maddening kind of frustrating person who's <laughs> constantly oh my god I would have killed the man if I'd been married to him and he's constantly uprooting his family always over and over and over and Ma's just so patient and saintly and you know my book kind of is like the anti Caroline Ingalls there is a character there who is who um, suffers from what they called prairie madness. It was a real thing that affected women of this time period, women who had been taken against their will, really, to, because of their husband's choices and had to leave their family and their friends behind and had to live, you know, to suddenly be alone with only their husband and their children on the prairie, which drove some women to the brink or past of, in, to, of insanity. And there's a character in the novel that does recognize this. So I just really want to focus on the women's stories, uh, not, you know, not just the ones who survive, but the ones who are destroyed by the elements and by the harshness mm -hmm. of that. I feel exactly. like prairie madness yes. has real parallels with being locked up at home with your family during the pandemic right now. Yeah, I think so. Obviously not intended that way. I, I, I finished it before the pandemic hit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that cooped up feeling, that that being, um, you know, in a place that you didn't choose to be, right? And, and, and some people rise above and some people descend. And I think one of the things about the book is that the human spirit, if we come together, in the best ways, we will survive and we will thrive. But there are then there are examples of us not rising to the occasion, and we are seeing that today as well. And we saw that in 1888 in the Children's Blizzard too. And that's you know that's the, a theme throughout all of your books. You know, women rising to the occasion. Now, Steph, we're gonna skip you right now because yours doesn't come out yet. Um, but we're gonna go. <laughs> but we're gonna go to Lauren. Um, we're gonna get to Steph. Don't put Steph Steph's in the corner. Um, now, Lauren, I, I think that for an individual writer, this book does steer a little bit away from your normal writing style too. Um, you know, because most of yours are bursting with mystery and romance. Um, can we say the Pink Carnation series? You know, we'll just go there. Um, so this book, I think, is a representation of, of the work that you've done with some of your co-authors and how they maybe have, did they influence you maybe to do a book like this, like a wartime book? Really? Actually, it's funny. It's very much the other way around. I grew up yeah. on the giant sagas of the 80s, on the Thornbirds and Carly oh, yeah. Cohen's Through a Glass Darkly and Gone with the Wind. And those were the books I always intended to write. And so I went off to grad school to get my PhD with this cunning plan. I was going to acquire the information to write absolutely accurate doorstop historical novels. And then, of course, everyone knew academics have these long summer vacations, ha, 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 where I can write <laughs> these doorstop historical novels. And, of course, along the way, I realized that there's no such thing as absolute accuracy when you're doing academic history. Everything's a footnote. Everything's an argument. And no, academics do not have three months of the year to lie around. <laughs> so while I was going mad, not with prairie fever, but with grad student fever, yeah. I wrote a spoof to take my mind off my frustrations with my dissertation. And that spoof was The Secret History of the Pink Carnation. It was a Scarlet Pimpernel spoof. It was Blackadder meets Bridget Jones meets Jane Austen meets The Scarlet Pimpernel. And it was purely for my own amusement, except that one of the friends in the small circle of people around whom it was circulating, um, and this thing is crammed with in-jokes, passed it to an agent who was a friend of hers. And next thing I knew, I had a two-book contract. And that became a 12-book series. But the funny thing was that was never those, I loved writing them. They were so much fun, but that, that was supposed to be the diversion. And so about 10 years into writing the Pink Carnation series, I decided this is it. You know, I love the pinks. I don't want to be the pink lady forever. And I wrote <laughs> a more serious, more historical sort of book. That book was The Ashford Affair. And mm -hmm. since then, I've written six standalones. Um, yep. Aside from my three that I've co-written, 
with my good friends, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And with each of those, I felt like I've been inching my way closer to the sort of book I always meant to write. Um, and my last book, Summer Country, which was a Caribbean saga and very oh, much a good. deep dive into, you know, Barbados history, was the sort of book I had always intended to write. Mm -hmm. This book, the funny thing is, um, unlike Melanie, I've never written biographical fiction. I've always dwelled in mm -hmm. what I think of as the Carleen Cohen end of historical fiction, where you take real people and real events, but in the midst of those, you plant your fake people. And your fake people are the emotional heart of the story. And their storyline is completely fake. They're made up as their pastiches of real people and bits you steal from real people and sew together. But they themselves and their plot line are your invention. This book, on the other hand, was handed to me on a platter. You know, I found the treasure trove I had always dreamed of as a grad student, a treasure <laughs> trove of letters telling this incredibly detailed story of all these women who went off to France at the height of World War I to you know, help French visitors. And not only did I have exactly what happened to them, I had multiple opinions about what happened to them, all written in the moment as they wrote home from the psalm. So suddenly I was drowning in primary sources. And this was, you know, basically I wound up, I, I had a big debate with myself. Do I write pure biographical fiction for the first time since I was 18? And I conned my school into letting me do an independent study about Napoleon's stepdaughter, where I wrote a novel about her. Or do I do my usual thing and create fake characters and put them into real situations? And so I, I, you know, affected a compromise. My two heroines in this book are entirely fictional, but most of the rest of the characters are largely are fictionalized versions of the real people. And everything that happens to the characters in this book happen to the real people. I simply have my real people in their place. So it is a big departure for me. In your book, the, the one thing that I like about yours is that it's just not one person. You know, you get Kate, who, you know, is just, is just along for the ride almost until she realizes that she's not, until she's kind of leading the whole thing. Um, and then you have Emmy. Emmy's just doing her her little debutante thing, thinking that she's gonna just help out. And, and then next thing you know, she's endorsing Kate. And then there's her cousin, Julia, who's just, you know, all of these women's trials, tribulations, experiences, you know, is really, it really exemplifies everything that women went through at that time, you know, so we're not just experiencing one person's challenge, but multiple people. And well, that was one of the things that really fascinated me when I found out about the Smith College Relief Unit, these women who were there right behind the front lines in World War One. my first question was, what makes a comfortable middle, upper middle class American woman who does mm -hmm. not have to decide to up and go to a war zone? Because these weren't Melanie's school teachers who were caught by the freak storm. These were mm -hmm. women who voluntarily paid their own way to wear really ugly uniforms, get on a ship <laughs> and go into a war zone in the mud with shells falling all around them and your snarky British officers stopping by pretending to borrow a cup of sugar. And so it, you know, I, and when I finally got my hands on the real letters they had written home, I found such a panoply of motivations that there, there were all sorts of people, reasons people decided to get up and go to the front. And I wanted to capture some of that. And the fact that no matter what drove them there, in the end, when the chips were down, whether their motives were pure or whether they were very, very mixed, they all did heroic things because, you know, that's what you have to do when the Germans invade and suddenly people's lives are on your hands. Are you trying to say that that's not your idea of a good summer vacation, Lauren? You know, I was the person who bailed out of summer camp after two weeks because I found it, you know, that was too much roughing it for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephanie, 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 Stephanie. This is the first book that you have written exclusively on your own since 2013. And it is a monster book. It's well, not just you know, awesome not. Easy. you're not easing into this gently. You said, I'm back, and you delivered this. Um, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, you know, again, the last the last set of books that you wrote were on your own, 
was your Cleopatra series. Um, you've been very successful with your co-writing. Obviously, we've got Ribbons of Scarlet, America's First Daughter. Um, what made this subject matter and these women, why, why this book? is basically the question. Why this book? Why these women? <laughs> I should note that um, I was working on this book since 2013. So this <laughs> was a long time in coming. Um, and I, I needed all that time, um, in part because I was always interested in the Marquis de Lafayette. I thought he was an interesting mm -hmm. figure, uh, a young man who came to America to fight in the American Revolution at the age of 19, he became a major general and he was good at it, even though he's only 19. I couldn't balance a checkbook at the age of 19. <laughs> so um, I thought he was a compelling figure, but I didn't know uh, enough about his the women in his life to write women's historical fiction about him just yet. I started to discover more in the process of writing America's First Daughter, where Lafayette is sort of a scene-stealing character who's yes, yes. In, 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 um, a big role in Patsy Jefferson's life. And then I was startled in My Dear Hamilton to find that he had played the, a similar role for Eliza Hamilton. And as I researched more, I realized that Lafayette, probably alone amongst the founding fathers, was extremely concerned with the wives and daughters of his comrades. And he was so young that he survived most of his revolutionary comrades. So when he came back to America in 1824, he started calling upon their widows and daughters. And I thought, what kind of, what makes a man so interested in the women uh, in this time period? Because that wasn't common. And I realized that he had an amazing wife. And um, I would have been content to write a story about Adrienne Lafayette, who is deserving of novel all in her mm -hmm. life. But then I discovered that Lafayette's castle served as a hiding place for Jewish children um, during the Holocaust. And I was very moved by that discovery and I had to know how that came about. And when I discovered that the chateau that Lafayette had been born in and that his wife sort of made her last stand during the French Revolution in, had been purchased reno and renovated by an American woman named Beatrice Chandler, I had to know all about this lady. And I went down a rabbit hole of research that included the family and included rewriting this book several times as we made new historical discoveries. <laughs> so it became an epic saga in my author life as well as on the page. <laughs> uh, but I, I am in love with it and I was just um, hopeful that I could do the story justice of, of three wars, three women and one legacy. Now, I, I know a little nugget um, based on previous interviews and, of course, following your path as you wrote this book for these past several years. Um, why don't you tell everybody your relationship with Beatrice? <laughs> uh, so the first novels that I published as a historical fiction author were about the daughter of Cleopatra and um, the biography that I based those books on was written by a woman named Beatrice Chandler, who, as it happens, is the same woman who, <laughs> who purchased Lafayette's castle and renovated and turned it into a sanctuary for children. I did not know that at the time <laughs> that I started this story, so it was a shocking revelation, a revelation and um, I felt at that point like I was sort of meant to tell this story, and uh, I, I hope that Beatrice is pleased with the way it came out because I uh, discovered many secrets about her life with her grandson, <laughs> Chandler's grandson. And um, and some of the rewriting re 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 that needed to be done. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we know that Adrian and, and Beatrice are based on true characters. Um, what about Martha? Uh, Martha is based on actual women who were at the Chateau uh, during World War II, but who remain unnamed in the historical record. We know that there was a, a school teacher working at the Chateau who was helping the resistance, but we don't know her name. Um, we know that Jewish children were saved there, but the woman who helped them is not named. 
So I couldn't really uh, attribute these these heroic acts to a historical person if I wasn't sure. So I felt like I had to make up a composite character. And I she does a really good job at, at tying everything together. I don't think you could have you could have done the book without her. Um, you definitely needed to have, now granted, I am one of those few people probably who would have loved a 600 page book on Adrian or on Beatrice, but that's just me. Um, and we're moving on from that because we can't just make it about me, now can we? Um, now this, this question's for all of you. Um, what made you decide, and, and through through your careers, um, predominantly you're, you've written about women in some way, shape or form. You are writing about women, whether it's women in an event, whether it's a biographical historical fiction book, but in every single book, there are women who are going through trials and tribulations. Did you as an author intend that? Or is that just kind of how it kind of worked out, you know, because based off of your research and based off of your own experiences? So Melanie, what, how about we start with you? I think I just started looking for, I mean, I stumbled into historical fiction just by going to an art museum and seeing a photograph of the real Alice in Wonderland and falling down that rabbit hole, finding <laughs> out about her relationship. And that was, you know, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to write historical fiction. I just wrote a book about that. And my agent said, you know, that's historical fiction. I didn't know. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I think I do look, what I've always done is try to look for the untold stories of history, right? The people we didn't learn about in the classroom. And that's going to be women by and large. Um, so I will say that I kind of have looked for women's stories that have either been overlooked by history or whose stories have been told by the men in their lives, which I really felt was the case with Anne Marl Lindbergh. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so now it is more of a deliberate thing. But I think when you are looking for the stories that nobody really knows, it's going to be women's stories by and large because, you know, history has been told by white men forever and ever and ever. And now it's starting to change. And um mm -hmm. You know, and I hope I like to think that we're kind of, you know, leading some of that change. Lauren, what about you? Well, I grew up on Jean Plady and Nora Lofts, uh -huh. where history was women's history, where, I mean, it was taken for granted that, of course, Caroline of Ansbach ruled England while George II was off playing with the mistress she arranged for him. And so all of history was female history and the women played the leading roles. And, you know, when I was in college, I was a Renaissance studies major and wrote my senior thesis on Marie de Guise, the Queen Regent of Scotland, in an era when there were more queens on thrones in Europe than there were kings. Mm -hmm. And so I always took it very much for granted that women played a central role in all of the great events in history. I found it a huge shock to my system when I got to grad school. And the assumption was that women's history was an outlier and that it's a separate discipline, that women's history wasn't just the history of the world. And part of the reason I wrote that first pink book, that first spoof, was to take the traditional narrative of the male swashbuckling spy and, you know, flip it, replace it with a female. Because you know, my I, at the time I was working on my dissertation on the English Civil War, and one of my chapters was on female royalist spies because they existed. And boy, let me tell you, they were sure <laughs> a hell of a lot more effective than their male counterparts who tended to get sloshed and spill all their secrets at the local tavern. The women <laughs> held it together much better, um, which is why many of them were never caught. And those who were generally tended to get out of it. So my, my whole career has been about rewriting that historical narrative and writing those lost female stories back in. And I have found it fascinating how strong our own historical preconceptions are, because with every single book I've written, whether it's about spies in Napoleonic Europe, or in this case, Smithies on the front lines of World War I, I have gone so many letters saying, but real women couldn't have done that. And then you trot out your historical examples and say, well, actually this woman did, and so did this, and here are the real people. But there's mm -hmm. still, we, we have, you know, as Melanie was saying, we have inherited such a history written by men that mm -hmm. even when we are encountering the real thing, we often believe it can't have been real. <laughs> I, I recently um, read a review on another book that said, oh, I, I didn't like this book because there's no way that these things actually happen. And I'm just shaking my head, like, you can't dismiss what people can do when they're challenged. 
right? So I just had to laugh at that. But well, that's it, drives me, it drives me crazy that we have these gut reactions of history that are generally shaped by popular culture in some way. That, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you watched Robin Hood growing up. Errol Flynn, Robin Hood, great movie, still love it. <laughs> but, you know, that was not the real Middle Ages. That was the Middle Ages as shaped by the 1930s and so on. And so, I mean, I think that often, you know, the the historical stories we consume growing up shape our ideas of reality. And then without going to check our facts, we react hard. I mean, part of the reason I wrote Band of Sisters was because when I stumbled on a memoir by Smithy, there behind the front lines, my first reaction was they couldn't have been there. Right. But in fact, they were. And so of course I had to write a whole book about it to prove to <laughs> everyone that in fact they were there. <laughs> but exactly. including what else would you do with that information? Yes. Of course you did. Steph, what about you? I mean, and even with all of the collaborations you've done with when you're writing just shorter stories, you're always writing about women. Uh, it's true. Um, one of the reasons that I loved Lauren's book so much is that I um, am a graduate of Smith College. So mm -hmm. I went to a women's college and I uh, was able to learn more about women's history there. And so that gave me a tendency to really want to explore that side of history, uh, thinking that it was a side, right? And then discovering later, you know, women are pretty much um, integrated into all of this. Somebody decided to make there be sides of history that way. Um, and so I think I, I come by it just from my background. When I started writing historical fiction, I did not intend to write women's historical fiction. My first idea was that I was going to write about Cleopatra's son, um, Caesarian. And yet when I found out that she had a daughter, I just kept hearing this woman's voice in my head that was ruining my story, or so I thought. And uh, so I had to reconceive that. And of course, once you've, you've written a novel and published it, then you understand more about the industry. and I just realized what a unique opportunity we have as historical fiction authors to help address some aspects of history that have been left unaddressed. And also I think that historical fiction authors in particular have the capability of telling stories that historians cannot tell because they can't tell it responsibly. They don't have the primary source material, whereas we can do what we want. It's kind of nice. I always say facts are for the historian, but emotions are for the novelist. And yeah. it's the emotional truth we can do that a historian can. Mm -hmm. And we get to speculate intelligently about gaps the way that historians can't, because there are many things we can't footnote, but you can make an educated guess. I think, yeah. you know, um, Marie Benedict's recent book about Agatha Christie is a great yeah. example of this, that you know, <laughs> no one knows what happened to Agatha Christie during her missing 11 days, but she does a wonderful job reconstructing it and finding the emotional truth that makes her answer to why she disappeared totally make sense. And it doesn't even, it doesn't matter sometimes. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, because like you said, you're, you're creating the emotional backstory to make a reader invested in what that character does. So, you know, we're not going to have all of the documentation for XYZ because it's just not available for XYZ reason. And that's why that's, I mean, if, if anybody ever looks at what I read, it's almost all historical fiction because A, I want to learn something and B, um, authors take those characters and make them relatable and it's just incredible to me. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter, honestly, if what There's, the words on the page. And there, I think we've all, I'm sure, characters. heard from readers for whom yeah. it does matter. Uh, you know, I'm sure we've all had the reader emails who are like, I want you to tell me what did you make up and what didn't and why. Right. And, and, and who, who get very bothered by the fact that they can't tell when they're reading our novels yeah. what we made up and what is based on fact. And, and, you know, sometimes I just say maybe you shouldn't be reading historical fiction <laughs> if it really bothers you that much. <laughs> you know, there are wonderful biographies and histories out there for you. But, you know, you do have to enter into this this um, uh, world that we've created based on reality, based on research, based on our best guess. Um, right. But yet you do kind of have to, you know, you have to trust us. And Ooh. maybe some readers can't. 
Yeah. And actually, so Steph has been doing a brilliant series on the different facets of historical fiction, because yeah. I think part of the issue is a lot of times readers aren't sure exactly what historical fiction means. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say to me, well, the characters in your books aren't real. How can you call it historical fiction? It's just fiction. And then there are other people who get bothered on the other end who feel that biographical fiction shouldn't be labeled as fiction at all. It's history with dialogue. So Steph has taken it on herself you know, yep. God bless you, to do a breakdown of all the different mm -hmm. subcategories of historical fiction and how these are all historical fiction, but with different expectations as there are in any subgenre. Right. And, and you know, each each historical fiction genre, subgenre, ha has a different goal. Yes. You know, so, I mean, that is also going to impact the author's um, desire effect on the reader. And a different um, contact with the reader. I think every subgenre, the readers go in with their own expectations. Mm -hmm. And if you are reading a Deanna Rayborn historical mystery, your expectations are very different than if you're going in and reading, you know, Stephanie's books about Cleopatra's daughter. You know, you're just, it's a different implicit agreement between author and reader. Yeah, and you're that's not a really good segue into the, to the next thing that I wanted to discuss. Do you, do you feel like the books and the women that you're writing about, the events that you're writing about, do you feel like that's making a difference or having an effect on people's perception of women in history? Ooh, got to think about that for a second. Go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> about the readers' perceptions of women in history. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. if, if we well, sure. I think so. Yeah. I mean, if people are reading our novels, they're they're wanting to learn. I think, you know, people come to historical fiction with they want to learn something and they want to be entertained, too. And um, yeah, I think so. I would hope so. And I think I'm sure we all have multiple places. You know, I do it in my readers, the author's note at the end, as well as on my website, where I do show the sources. And I do say, please, if you really are intrigued, go read this. And the one thing I hear from readers all the time is I couldn't stop Googling when I was reading your book yeah. or after I was reading your book. So I think that alone says that, yeah, I, I, I think people are more appreciative of women's stories today than maybe they were 15, 20 years ago in historical fiction. I do think that, yeah. And I think cumulatively, cumulatively, we are all part of a shift in the zeitgeist. And that even if, you know, individually our books might not have that kind of effect, when you're reading 50 books about ordinary civilian women who affect change during World War II, that does begin to affect your perception of women mm -hmm. in that era and what they did. I think that's a wonderful point, Lauren. And, you know, I, I don't, I couldn't presume that my books had any particular impact, but I always love um, hearing about stories of readers who visit Monticello and they start asking questions about Patsy Jefferson that they, they wouldn't have asked before. And so um, that kind of thing really warms my heart and at least at least it makes me feel like I'm making a, a little tiny dent. So that's my hope. Well, I know that I went when I went to the Schuyler Mansion, um, <laughs> the docent there was thrilled to tell me all about his his time talking with the famous Stephanie Dre. Um, <laughs> so at the very least, your name's getting out there, right? <laughs> what women, I mean, it's International Women's Day, right? We're celebrating women, we're celebrating the impact women have had on our own lives. Um, what women can you say have truly impacted you? like famous women or or just e women in our lives either or either or okay i'll take one for the team um <laughs> i'm gonna take one no one will have heard of unless you are a new yorker um the headmistress of the little all girls school i attended for 13 years she was <laughs> someone she had gotten a scholarship to smith and it had changed her life forever. And her first job out of Smith was as a history teacher at an all girls school in New York. And she rose to headmistress and was headmistress there for 40 years where she had very firm ideas about how a young lady should comport herself. And a lot of that was proving that you are smarter than the boys and giving back everything that had been given to you. Basically Steph, she was bringing Smith 
to my school. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because reading the Smithies late, you know, I felt such a sense of kinship with these women whose letters I was reading. I realized it's all of the things that they hold dear were the things that Mrs. Berenson drummed into us. But this was a woman who took it as her life's mission to educate young women and fill them on top of that with a sense of service both to the world at large, but in particular to womankind. And one thing that she used to impress upon us that really you know, made an impression on me was that everything we did reflected not just us, but on all women. That we had to show everyone that we were the best and the brightest because we were proving it not just about ourselves, but about women in general. And I think that's something that, and I would love to say that no longer matters, but I think it still does. Great. Um, as for me, I have um, many strong women in my family, including a great grandmother who immigrated to this country at the age, I believe she was 12. Uh, she had been a goat herder in, uh, in Italy. She did not speak English. She never uh, learned actually, but my mother was a college graduate. So within generations, uh, she got to see the family fortunes turn around and she was very tough. She was very ambitious for her family. And so I always sort of have a uh, big mom's ghost in the background of my uh, thinking, although she did not think highly of me. I remember once she told my, <laughs> told my mother that she was really worried about me that I would never get married because I couldn't cook, I couldn't sew, and she said, she can't even milk a goat. <laughs> I don't have any strong female figures in my life. I never really have. Um, there are just, my family is an extremely uninspiring kind of a story. And there's nobody came, overcame great odds to do anything. And the women were just kind of very passive. And uh, so I don't have, and I had two brothers growing up and I have two sons now. So I don't, I, one of these women, I don't have many women in my life. I've always gravitated more towards male friendships and I've always just been surrounded by men. But I will say female authors inspire me, especially those of a different era than, um, than us. And I'm going to throw a name out there, which is so insane, but I, I love Edna Ferber. I don't know if you've all read her novel. Mm -hmm. She was doing historical fiction back in the 20s, right? Mm -hmm. With the giant showbo and so big and all those great, great sweeping historical fiction novels about strong women. I mean, she was mm -hmm. doing that back in the 20s. And that wasn't really you know, I mean, she would plop her down right now and she would fit right in with the rest of us. <laughs> and she inspires me um, because she was, you know, she was she was not a glamorous woman. She was a hard worker. You know, she kind of didn't get caught up in the Algonquin roundtable kind of thing, which she was sort of a part of. But she always left early to go write another book. And I just really admire her and many other female authors of an earlier era. I mean, Louise May Alcott. Right. And um um, um, oh gosh, now I'm just uh, Lucy, Lucy <laughs> Maud Montgomery, Daphne du Maurier. I mean, just Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. They're just, I think they're probably the most influential women in my life. Yeah. Now we, I don't think we can, we can fully embrace International Women's Day without applauding ourselves for getting through this past year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's been a rough year uh, and, and we've got, I'm, I'm looking at some of the, the comments in the chat. Um, Arlene would like to know um, how your ritual or routine, what it is initially, but then if it did in fact change during this pandemic that we've all been struggling to cope with this past year. Um, yeah, this is the year I didn't write a book, and that's the first year in, in 11 years. Now, I say that, and it's true. I had planned on taking this year off because I had published seven books in 10 years, and I wrote two others that I didn't publish because I didn't like them in that time period. So I had always kind of, there was just a kind of a natural confluence of now I think is a good time for me to take a little time off, reassess my career, reassess what I want to do as a writer, where I should go, what 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 is the landscape before me, and give my brain a little rest. Mm -hmm. That it, it happened during a pandemic year. Um, 
I think was both a blessing because honestly, I don't think I could have written this year. I've had such a hard time concentrating and um, also a sadness because then I didn't get to go travel and do all the fun things I thought I was going to do this year. Right. So um, in that way, it did it obviously changed my schedule and my routine. Um, I really have had a hard time concentrating. I haven't read as much as I usually do. I've, uh, you know, my, I've been up, Side down like everyone, but I will say I don't have school age children at home. I'm ancient. I'm so much older than you people. Um, but my hat, my hat is off. My heart goes out to every single woman with children, school age children right now during this pandemic. And what a year it has been. And I don't, I have no idea how you've done it. And um, you are the heroes. Cheers. And um, cheers to you all. I, I don't know how you've there done you it. Yeah. <laughs> That Lauren's giving us the clue right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Why? it's really more coffee. No, because because basically, I am every single article you've read about the parents are not okay and mothers are falling out of the workforce. That's me. So <laughs> when we went to lockdown in New York almost exactly a year ago, my mm -hmm. my first day locked in the apartment was March 11th. My kids were two and six, <gasps> and the toddler kept pulling me over to the window saying. Mommy, the park is that way. Because he thought it was like I'd forgotten where to go. And like, oh, we can't go. He's like, no, no, it's over there. You can take me out the door and down there. I'm like, no, we live within these four walls now. And, you know, there was suddenly no play group and no school and no babysitter. Mm -hmm. It was just the four of us in the apartment. And I was on book deadline for Band of Sisters. So the mm -hmm. first thing we did before we ordered food for the kids and, you know, important stuff like Cheez-Its and Kraft Mac and Cheese <laughs> was we got me a Nespresso machine. And my husband, who works one of these jobs where you do not take time off for childcare, our deal was he would give me from 11 to 1 every day because that was sort of the time you could take off for a lunch, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I would lock myself in with my two Nespresso pods and I would write for those two hours and that was my work time. And then I was back on mom duty. And when I say was, we're actually still in this situation right yeah. now. So um, it's been interesting doing book tour on two hours a day of work time. Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, my, my work life has changed radically. It's, you know, in some ways it really helped me with writing Band of Sisters. I've always been an adrenaline worker and there were weird resonances between the early stages of the pandemic and what I was writing about. It has been less helpful since then. Well, I've been trying to juggle the new book, a Team W book, and all the manifold things that go into launch. And I just, I can write a book in two hours a day. I can't write two books and handle launch. So we wound up having to push off my next book which was supposed to come out in spring 2022 to spring 2023. So I hope people won't think I'm a slacker. Blame my kids. <laughs> you know? No, no, no. I, I don't think anyone who has created anything during this time, whether it's just a grocery list, I mean, bravo to you, because it's just been yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, finishing up the Women of Chateau Lafayette when the pandemic hit. I was still editing, and then I felt like, um, I felt very put upon because it was a very hard book to write, I thought. And then the pandemic struck and it really put everything in perspective. And I thought, my life is not that hard. Just finish <laughs> this book. Um, and, and actually, I feel like historical fiction has at least helped get me through the pandemic. Because, and I want to call out um, Melanie's book, I, which I yeah. absolutely loved. Thank um, you. And and you you broke me at part of it. So and you you even have a hawk in this book, and it works. Yeah. You, it's amazing. That's so funny. You and Kate about the hawk. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. You guys are obsessed about the hawk. It's like yeah. and you. But I just I felt like it showed me how how hard life has been for women in the past for previous generations and that even though this period of time is definitely going to go down in history as a difficult time for all of us we are still quite fortunate and so every time I felt like whining or I felt like I was unraveling I I would remember uh the struggles of women in your books and and it would help 
You know, I'm, I was so lucky. I turned mine in in January and then the pandemic hit in March. So I had only edits to do and copy edits. And that was great because I could handle that task. You know, it's like that's like somebody tells you what to do and you go do it rather than looking at the black blank page and then you know, starting a new and or creating, uh, you know, creating. And so I was really, really grateful that I had that to do, um, that I had something to do during this time period. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I just, I could not create. Um, it was very, very hard, you know, to think about doing that. Now I'm back in the saddle again and I'm, I'm going ahead, but um, yeah, I took it. Yeah. I was a coward. I took the easy way out. <laughs> I don't know if you can no, say that. No, 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 no. With this. Yeah, I, I mean, you might not have been creating, but you did move. So I did you know, move. That's, 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 yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. like I did the other thing they say you're not supposed to do in a time period of great crisis and change is make a big change in your life. And my husband and I moved from Chicago to uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, where <laughs> it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> And there's actually spring yeah. and we can go for walks outside and we're not crowded by hundreds and hundreds of people on the sidewalk. And it um, it was a healthy thing for us to do. I'm very glad we did it. But I miss Chicago. Love it. Can't wait to go back and see my son who lives there. Spring is next week. Don't get excited. It only lasts about a week. So. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Here, it's great. Oh, my gosh. Chicago, there's no spring. It's winter and then it's summer. There's nothing in between. And here it's already beautiful, more beautiful than it ever was in Chicago. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, do you guys have, do you get a sense of relief when you're when you're done with the book? Um, you're done writing it, you're done editing it. It's been blessed on by, by your editors and your publishers. Do you get a sense of relief or do you start then panicking and stressing out because then it's book launch time. And is that a whole different level? I see you smiling, Steph. Um, <laughs> Um, what, what does that, what does that do for your psyche? Go ahead, Steph, you're first. Uh, I almost always have to have an intervention at the time <laughs> that my book is done. Um, my editor and my agent have to pry the manuscript out of my hands because I can always find something else that I want to fix or change. And I'm always stressed out that I missed something. Uh, I think I was even emailing Lauren in a panic because something in her book came up about the ship that she was on. And I thought, oh, no, did I get that wrong? Um, but if, so I never actually I think I never finish a book. I just abandoned them. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Lauren? Because this is, you know, you're you're right at book launch. You know, yours just came out last week. So you're you're in the in the midst of it. Right now I'm in a weird situation because usually at this point, by the time my book launches, I'm usually already mostly done or entirely done with the next one. So it's very weird to still to not be deep in the headspace of the next one because the nice thing about that is you're so immersed in the book you're working on that the book that's launching is very old news and you have to go yeah. on book and try to remember what it was about. And it's horrible because people will ask you things and you're like, I knew this last year. I swear I wrote this book. <laughs> you know, they'll ask you about like historical facts and you'll know you knew them and you can picture the page in the book you read it on, but you don't remember it anymore because you've been immersed in something else. Um, what's very weird to me right now is because I wound up, um, because of the no childcare situation, not progressing with the new book, my head is still much more in band of sisters than it otherwise would have been, which leads to the sorts of anxiety Steph is talking about, where you're like, wait, did I get something wrong? Because you're still attached to that. I've always conceived of my books as balloons. They're balloons on a long string. And as I pass them along various stages of the editorial process, they drift a little farther. There are points when you can still grab the string and pull it back. But once the book is published, that's it. It's out there. It's floating free, like in that weird French kids movie with the balloon. <laughs> I don't know what that movie is. I'm trying to think of that movie. We I had to watch it in middle school French class. But it had, there was this okay. balloon. It floated uh, around. It was very French. You know, I'm, it's what, something you said is so true. One, I am always really happy to finish a book. Like, I love the book. 
but I'm almost always ready to go to the next thing. I, I think I, I have book ADD. And, and, and so I am not, so once it out of, it's out of my hands, I mean, I'm, you know, certainly think about it during edits and copy edits and stuff like that. But then usually this year being the exception, I'm, as you say, I start the next one. So by the time the book comes out, like you said, I'm almost done with the next book. And that's where my heart is. And that's where my head is. So I do generally read my book again right before i go on tour i have found that to be very helpful and it's an odd thing to be sitting there and reading your book this is melanie benjamin it's, it's very odd it seems very conceited but it's not it's really helpful for me because like you said i have to kind of reacquaint myself with it um again this year was an exception with the children's blizzard that i didn't write during this time period but you know i love my books but i'm I could never write a series. I, I, I just I don't like to stay in the same headspace. I'm I'm always wanting to explore something new. So I'm I love them and I'm happy to say goodbye to them. That actually that leads to Arlene. Um, she had a question earlier and she had a several, but the one question is really ties into what we're talking about. So you immerse yourself in one book, you you divorce it, and you move on to the next book. But do you do that when you're writing? Do you have inhabit your characters and the time period so much so that it makes it difficult to switch from writing mode to mom mode or you know just everyday present day reality mode? Um, so talk about that switch a little bit. Um, so when I was writing America's First Daughter with Laura Kamoy. I started speaking in a southern accent. Um, <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> it, was, it was super annoying. My husband found it hilarious. I was not as amused. But I, I do feel like I'll, I'll get amused, or I'm sorry, I'll get immersed. And um, this was helpful to know in this current book, The Women of Chateau Lafayette, because now I was having to write the, from the voice of three different women in three different time periods. And so what I decided to do was something that I've never done before and maybe will never do again. I wrote all three parts separately. I wrote them <laughs> as one one book uh, for each person because I, I, I know I know people who've not. done that and I can't fathom it. I can't. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> but it I was, know other authors have done it. Yeah. I I felt like I had to do it because I didn't think I'd be able to switch from say an 18th century voice, which is very formal and stilted with that sort of um, language from that day to the 1940s or 30s and 40s, where now we have different slang and jazz and um, and a much younger, much different kind of heroine. Um, so I did write them all separately and I thought, all right, well then I'll braid them together. That was, that is what I did. Uh, it was not as easy as I thought it might be. It was nightmarish, in fact. And, um, there was a, a point where my editor started printing out chapters and laying them on her floor and reordering them. And we reordered the early chapters maybe 20 times. So if you don't like the order, I apologize, but that's what we settled on. So hopefully that was the right order. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I've written books with multiple points of view and I could never do it that way. I will say though, none of mine have inhabited different time periods. They've all been people experiencing the same thing. It's just from different points of view and different voices. And um, I'm quite comfortable um, hopping from head to head to head to head and doing it organically. You know, I'll be writing a chapter and then go, hmm, a responsive avenue. No, I think Truman should interject here. And then I would just switch over to his point of view and write the next chapter. And like, okay, now we need to hear from Slim. And then I, that it would just, I would hear it. I was listening to their voices. I do listen to the people's voices in my head. And I do, um, I didn't start writing until I was much older. I wasn't published until I was in my 40s. I didn't have my first bestseller until I was in my 50s. My kids were grown. They still were living at home in the beginning, but they weren't little kids. I, I need the immersive experience to write. I need the lug, the freedom and the luxury of, t of being able to live with these people 24 seven. Um, you know, I, I may not be writing 24 seven, but when I'm not writing, they're still there and, and I'm still thinking about them. And um, it's probably not easy for my husband to live with someone who has all these different voices in her head. Um, <laughs> but that's just the way I write. I can't compartmentalize it. Um, I do have to just, 
absolutely live with these people 24 seven. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm walking around. Somebody asked me when I wrote the autobiography of Mrs. Tom Thumb, if I walked around on my knees a lot during <laughs> the writing of that. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so, because uh, she was 32 inches tall, I don't do that. Okay, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm not living like I'm in the 1880s when I'm not writing about the book, but I certainly am thinking all the time about them. And so, yeah, I, I do write that way. I'm having so much fun. I don't want us to close, but I do have one final. But Lauren comment. didn't answer that question, did she? Ooh, no, I, just I almost escaped there. Um, nice. Good job. Well, <laughs> let's see. So I've had the opposite experience in a number of ways. I was a published author for 10 years before I had my first child. So, but I was always writing around other things. I wrote around grading grad student papers. I wrote around being a law student. I wrote around working at a law firm. So I always had times where I was either immersed or I was off where you know I need a chunk of time to really fall into the story and the characters. I'm not one of those people who can write in snippets. But then when I'm doing something else, I'm doing something else. And so with my kids, it's I know my writing time during the day is that time when I'm with those people. And then I turn it off when I go into mom mode. Although I do like Stephanie, a certain amount of method acting, I would say, where you know when I was writing, I had a 1920s Bright Young Things book. I read lots of Nancy Mitford, and I think my kids picked up much more <laughs> 1920s British slang than any child really ought to. Um, when I was writing my Regencies, everything got very Austin-esque. And okay, I've never, I haven't told the story. I'm a little embarrassed. When I was writing Band of Sisters, I was so inspired and so living in the world of their can-do attitude and their let's chip in and make everything better. And yes, the Germans are invading, so we're going to start pop-up canteens. And this was when New York locked down and there was a shortage of PPE and things like that. And people were talking about doctors wearing garbage bags. And I was so wrapped up in the spirit of the Smithies and their slang that I emailed the president of the Alumni Association of the all girls school I attended. It was like, what should we be doing as a community to fix this problem? Should we be organizing mass sewing among all the Chapin girls? It was sort of like, okay, calm down, kiddo. And I look back, I realized I was swept up in the fever of the book I was writing writing and it did it did spill over into my own life because you do you pick up elements of the characters you're working on you know some some more than others and some better than others i mean in that case i think it was a fairly benign madness since all i wanted to do was organize girls to sew masks <laughs> <laughs> well you could have just baked on mass and like delivered to the hospital or something like that <laughs> you know which yeah. is always a good thing <laughs> Be a donut dolly or something like that. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, one of the things as a librarian that I've noticed is that um, women authors, and specifically women historical fiction authors, are on the rise. Um, I see so many more books published in this genre than I think have been in the past. Um, and we talked a little bit about that, you know, basically, you know, first off, women are home taking care of the kids, you know, during this pandemic. Um, it is an escape from everything that's going on. Or, you know, I've heard that by a lot of readers that the reading is their escape. They don't want to deal with reality so much anymore. Um, women, women's historical fiction just seems to be on the rise. Um, certainly, you know, we, we've got your books that have come out. Um, Kristen Hanna's Four Winds book, uh, the whole list on that, ladies, is ridiculous. Um, you know, Kate Quinn's got a new book coming out. Melanie Benjamin's got a new book. I mean, I could go on and, and list so many of these authors. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's this huge rise? I mean, it, certainly we saw a huge spike in historical fiction with the World War II anniversaries, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's certainly been that. And historical fiction's always been there. But right. do you do you feel like do you see this in your own perspective? You know, do you see a rise and an increase in women's historical fiction? I, yeah, I think so. I think we all. I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I know many authors who um, were published in one genre before, and I was one of them actually back in two thousand five. And chiclet mostly, right? And then when that kind of the bottom fell out of that market a lot of women started writing historical fiction 
And um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, and then so in like when I was first published in historical fiction it was 2010, and it actually wasn't that big then. There was like Nancy Horan's book. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you know, Lauren had. You know, you certainly the the you your books were out then, but there wasn't. Uh, I don't know if Steph's were then. I well, that, that was the great Tudor group boom. 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 That was Philippa Gregory and the other Boleyn yeah. girl and the other Boleyn. Right, Boleyn right. the Tudors, like, right. Yeah. Margaret George. That was a flavor of historical fiction. I think that was really more um, a sort of a last gasp of the old school of historical fiction, yeah, which I think of as the, the crowned heads behaving badly school of historical fiction, as opposed to this new wave, which I think is really characterized by it being about ordinary people doing extraordinary things that we're and looking more contemporary at. too i think more yeah. contemporary right i don't other i mean the steph's books did very very well set in the revolutionary time period but not i mean but i think for the most part more, more than the lately the, the successful historical novels seem to be like you know i would say like 1900 maybe into the 20th century right mm -hmm. uh, so i think that kind of there is a you know that is a bit on different now than maybe 15 20 years ago but yeah, certainly, I, I think there's a big increase in that. And why is I think because we're discovering these amazing stories, you know, about women that have not been told, and there's still so many left. I had a patron, a male patron, actually make a comment about it because he noticed. He's like, there aren't any, any really a lot of new books about from male authors. I was like, well, you better tell them to get writing. Like, we can't buy what's not on the market. You know, so you know, yeah, tiny violin off. about the sadness about not enough male right, authors. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Also, that women next month just hold out. You know, we know. I wonder if also know. just that women read so much more fiction than men do. That I mean, I know it's sort of it's a stereotype, but men for the most part seem to gravitate towards nonfiction and women to fiction. So it's not surprising that this new wave of historical fiction should be female driven. And let's face it, ladies, we all know, maybe it's always been there, but the coverage in the book world tend has always, it's been so, so male dominated, right? So mm -hmm. probably we've always been there and this kind of historical fiction has probably always been there, but it's really only very recently that it's gotten any kind of attention in the normal book places, you know, where people review space, publicity space, Mm -hmm. um, the rise of the book clubs, like um, starting with starting with Oprah, but certainly yeah. with GMA and Reese and Jenna Hager and all that, that has also kind of made brought more attention to us. I think we've been there all along, really, when I think about it. Well, actually, and that's an interesting point because you know we talk about writing back in when stories. There are so many. I remember attending a lecture years ago on forgotten bestsellers of the late 19th century. There are these women who were blockbusters in their times who we've never ever heard of. And I mean, across the board, you know, in any era, there are probably women because who were topping the bestseller charts whose names have now been forgotten because they mm -hmm. weren't taught in school, right? Because it was so male author oriented that those were the books that were taught in school not the female authors with very few exceptions yeah who reads fanny bernie as evelina these days uh, yeah 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 so arlene, uh, arlene you've been making some great comments so thank you arlene um but she made a great she summarized perfectly she said i think historical fiction by women authors is popular because it captures the voice and experience and struggles of womanhood and how those are overcome through courage and resilience. So I think that sums it up, right? So one last parting thing before we go, who's working on what? <laughs> Stephanie, what are you working on? Uh, I am. Um, I am working on tell us. I do. I am working on a brand new book about, I think, the most important American woman in history. Uh, and that woman is Frances Perkins, our first female cabinet secretary. I think she's the most important woman in American history because her accomplishments were so sweeping. She was the architect of the New Deal. There's, uh, there is no American whose life is not touched by her work today. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really excited to tell her story about her accomplishments but also her relationship with FDR, which was uh, a little bit fraught. It was not romantic, 
Um, <laughs> One of the few women. Okay. I was wondering. You had me so curious there for a moment. No, it was. It was not romantic, but um, FDR was a very Machiavellian figure, and Francis Perkins was a do-gooder, and so they did not always see eye to eye, and and yet their relationship elevated each other's work. So. Uh, it was a true meeting of the minds. Uh, if he could be the love of her life without romance, he was. Hmm. Melanie, what are you working on? Yeah, I can't yet tell. Like I said, I took this year off. So I, I actually made a lot of changes in my professional life. I have a brand new agent now. I've made that made an a switch in that way. And um, so we we uh, so she and I have been she's been wonderful so far and I love her. And I th I know what I want to write. I've started it. But we're um, you know, I have a publisher and we're just kind of starting to talk with them about it. So I can't really yet share. But I, I, I will say. I need her in my life right now, the woman I'm writing about. She is a kick-ass woman. And um, I, I think I, I need that energy and that positivity and that living life on my own terms kind of energy she brings. So I'm very excited to, to tell her story and to write about her, but yet yeah, can't share yet. Sorry. Okay, well, I'm gonna hold you to another conversation then for when we can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Lauren, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on a prequel to the Smith book, Smith 2, The Resmithening. Um, I love it when you're writing a book and a character starts poking you saying, hey, 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 me, me, pay attention to me, and starts dropping hints about their life at you, even when you're not paying attention. I was really fascinated by the real life founder of the Smith College Relief Unit, a woman named Harriet Boyd Hawes, who had one of these crazy lives you think was fiction, except she actually did all these things. She graduated from Smith in the 1890s and went off to Greece, determined to excavate. She went off to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, where the boys felt very big that they were letting women in. And she got there and said, okay, I'm here to dig. And they said, ladies don't dig. Would you like to be a classical librarian? And she was like, no, 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 you don't understand me. I'm here to dig. But while she was there, the Greco-Turkish War broke out. And so she decided, as one does, that she was going to go to the front and nurse, even though she totally failed her Red Cross exam. <laughs> but she pulled strings. She had friends in high places because she was a character. And so she called in her friends and got herself sent to the front and was decorated by Queen Olga of Greece. But something happened. Something happened there while she was out there nursing at the front because she takes this weird break. And like a year later, she goes back to Greece, she digs up Crete, she becomes a famous archeologist. But in that intervening year, she has some sort of breakdown or something. And she winds up going back to the States and nursing in the Spanish-American War. And I was like, what on earth is this woman doing in Cuba? And then her life picks back up exactly the way one would expect, as if none of this had ever happened in the interim. And I can't tell you what happened exactly to the real woman, partially because the archives at Smith are closed right now, first because of the pandemic, and then because of the construction of a new library. So that was slightly frustrating. But I have a fictionalized version of this woman. And she, while I was writing Band of Sisters, kept trying to tell me what happened in that intervening year and what happened to her in Greece that drove her to Cuba and what happened to her in Cuba that turned her into the woman who later founded the Smith College Relief Unit. So it's a story of two wars and a young woman's journey of discovery and redemption and also Theodore Roosevelt acting badly. <laughs> oh, the Roosevelts, you know, what else? But I mean, he's such a fun side character. You know. Oh, to be able to travel again, right? Oh my God, yes. Soon, soon we will be able to travel. In fact, actually one year ago, I was on probably the last round of cruise ships uh, and enjoyed a week in the Bahamas. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> Let's say one year ago, I was on the end tail end of tour for my last co-book with Beatrice Williams yeah. and Karen White, All the Ways We Said Goodbye. And it's so funny looking back on like taking two planes a day, hugging lots of people. Mm -hmm. It's like a different world. It, it definitely is. I mean, I've seen I've seen Steph on tour. I haven't had the chance to to meet either of you other two, but we're gonna get there. Um, yeah. Be it be at yeah. ALA or H and S or yeah. in some way, shape, or how. Steph, did, um, we did we do an event in San Diego the uh, through Adventures by the Bro Book? 
Were you not? This is our first meeting. I was very, I've been trying to hold in my fangirling this whole time. No, I don't know. Okay, but so then it was your, it was your co-author then. She, because we, there were two keynotes and I was one, but I, I, it must have been your co, your co-author. And she, and she did, she wasn't there very long. She just like came in and did it. So I didn't get to really, all right. Mm -hmm. I thought we, I thought we'd met. I thought, you know what I did yesterday over the weekend? It was so sad. My husband and I drove to the Richmond airport just to drive around at an airport. <laughs> just like drove wow. up to the departure thing. And we're like, this is the thing we used to do. <laughs> okay, well, look, next time you do that, I expect you to just kind of swing on by and say hello. Uh, we were just trying to get used to get used I'm to the not new that airport. Far from there. <laughs> but we just wanted to see an airport again. We are so pathetic. <laughs> oh my god. Ladies, I am I am in awe of all of you. I am honored that you agreed to do this to celebrate International Women's Day for us. Um, I applaud you. I applaud everything that you do for literature and for women's history. Um, again, thank you so much um, for everybody who has joined us. Thank you so much for for joining us. Um, I think we had a very lively chat. Um, certainly not not your typical author's chat. I don't think um, the video will be uh, available on Facebook for you to be able to go ahead and peruse at your leisure. And also make sure you know, Pamunkey Regional Library does have both the Children's Blizzard. And band of sisters on the show, ready for you to go. And, and soon. we will have the chateau um, when it gets published at the end of the month. So thank you. Continue, you know, continue writing, ladies, because honestly, I don't know what I would do without you. Because <laughs> you know, there you go. Um, again, I appreciate you. Love to all. Thank you. Um, thank you. Take care of yourselves. Everyone, stay safe and get your COVID. Stay safe. Stay safe. Get vaccinated. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.